fragile. It's a fact we're learning in real time, every day. What we once called normal has seemingly disappeared. There's uncertainty in the air, restlessness in our hearts. Things we once took for granted are becoming difficult to find. Our usual day-to-day has evolved into this odd chaos. Peace is becoming obsolete. Many have lost jobs, security, and those they love. 
The pain is undeniable. But what if our fragility caused us to lean harder into God? What if in our weakness, we chose to rely more on His strength? Would our outlook change? Would the peace that passes understanding begin to drown out the noise of this moment? Would we walk in a quiet confidence, knowing our God is mighty to save? We're not promised tomorrow, but we are given a simple truth to stand on. Our God goes before us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Yes, life is fragile. But in our weakness, He is strong. Welcome again to our online service. Jesus' words in Matthew chapter 10 are these. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them will fall to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. I love those words. They're comforting. They're poetic. They're powerful. Uh, we do serve a wonderful God, God who is sovereign and God who we can trust. And I believe those words are so important for us today as the world uh, continues to be in trouble in many ways. And I think more and more as the world is in trouble, God is looking to us, his people, to see that we're pressing into his heart, we're hearing from him. We are, in fact, his hands and his feet because he is sovereign. He holds this world in his hands and he wants us to learn about trusting him. So speaking of the sovereignty of God, we have a special guest speaker today and that is her topic, the sovereignty of God and that we can trust him even in our darkest times. And so today we have um, Ali Shizkoski. Now, Ali actually is not new to our church. She just started coming to Oshawa Temple just before the pandemic. I had a chance to meet with her a couple times before we were in lockdown, but I suspect many of you have not. 
Some of you, however, do know Allie because she's a longtime Salvationist, and uh, she actually has just been hired as the executive assistant to the divisional commander here in, in Ontario. So I'm delighted, and I hope that you will welcome Allie with me as she brings the Word of God today to us here at Oshawa Temple. This afternoon at two o'clock, many of you will know because you've registered that we have another gathering outside. Now I'm recording this a few days before Sunday, so I'm hoping and assuming that the weather will be good. So assuming the weather is nice today, we will meet at two o'clock on the lawn outside of our church building where we have some testimonies and some music and just a nice time for us to connect together. And that means that we are getting close. Next Sunday, September 19th, is our Welcome Home Sunday. Can you believe it? We're finally here when we're having our very first in-person worship service at the core. Now, that service will be live streamed. So I know we have some friends and those of you that are not even from this city. You can continue worshiping with us online. And I believe that many of you from our own church, you're a little nervous still about coming out. So you can still worship with us at the same time, 11 o'clock next week online. Um, You will need to register for that. And the registration will be up in the next couple of days for next Sunday. Now, just before Sunday, September 18th, September 19th, on Saturday, September 18th, we are calling um, a church-wide prayer meeting, which we're, we're so excited about, David and I, because if we can be a people intentional in getting on our knees and coming before God and really committing together to be a people of prayer, then God can continue to do mighty works in us and through us. So I hope that you will join us in person uh, for Saturday evening at seven o'clock on September 18th. But if you'd rather once again to worship uh, with us online for that prayer meeting, it will be live streamed. So you can um, just uh, keep a lookout for those details. For those of you who would like to register, but you're not sure how to do it online, by all means, call Julie at the office and you can register with her over the phone. So my friends, this marks the last, as far as we know, of our closed, our online services outside of the church building. Who knows where this pandemic is taking us, but we are believing that now ever so gradually in a safe way, we are opening up our church doors. But let's thank God right now for his faithfulness and for his love for us. Pray with me, please. Father, thank you for who you are, for being God, for being great and mighty and powerful, for being sovereign. Thank you for your wisdom, for your courage. Thank you that we can understand who you are by looking into your word. And Lord, as we consider the many pressing needs of our world, whether we look to Afghanistan or Haiti, um, whether we consider uh, natural disasters or racism, so much, God, there's so much for us to be troubled about in our world. Yet, I believe, Father, that you want your wisdom, your love to increase in us so that we are truly your hands and your feet in this world. So I pray for that, Father. I pray for increased clarity and direction for all of us. Thank you for our church, for Oshawa Temple. Thank you that we're opening up next week, God. I pray for your blessing on all the logistics. And thank you, Lord, for today in advance as we continue to worship you. Thank you for Allie, who's bringing your word. And right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray your anointing on the message, because it's all ready for us, Lord, but that that message will be what you would have us hear today. Thank you, God. We love you. We worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you, friends.
From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able Oh, I will sing i
Well, good morning. It is certainly really good to be here this morning to share with you um, and to share with you a subject dear to my heart, and that's the sovereignty of God. Um, and I've entitled my message, Hope in the Dark, in hopes that this morning we might find some hope in the dark. But first, I'd like to take a look at what sovereignty actually is. Um, just start out by unpacking that. Um, by definition, in the Webster's Dictionary, sovereignty is uh, defined as supreme power or authority. Some synonyms that are mentioned in the uh, definition are supremacy and control, influence or sway. And while the concept of another entity being in control of everything, thus insinuating to us that we have no control can be daunting, my hope this morning is to unpack the idea of the sovereignty of God in a way that will in fact um, elicit the exact opposite feelings, um, a sense of security, a sense of surety in our lives in our lives, regardless of the landscape or the terrain, or regardless of what we're facing, that we may find, perhaps today, some hope in the dark. Now, the sovereignty of God, as you may already know, is a massive topic amongst Christians um, and in our faith. And there are probably a million directions that I could have gone with this message. However, I was drawn to one passage of scripture in particular as I was spending time with God in reflection as I prepared. And so I'd like to use excerpts from the writings recorded in the book of Habakkuk to help illustrate this idea, this concept, the truths about the sovereignty of God. To set a little bit of context for the book, basically what was happening in this short book is that Habakkuk was deeply troubled by the world that he saw around him. There was a lot of darkness, there was a lot of ruin, um, and he was looking for some hope, he was looking for some purpose, he was looking for some reason for all of this that was going on. And he was disturbed in particular by the behavior of the Israelites at the time. It was a brutal situation, in fact. Um, the people were living in a heightened state of iniquity and sin, and all he could see before him when he looked around at the landscape was violence and strife and contention between people, just a whole lot of brokenness. To him, the outlook uh, of this landscape was hopeless. To Habakkuk, the situation that he saw around him was beyond repair. And certainly for him, any hope of restoration was completely beyond his personal control. And so he was looking for a sense of hope in the darkness that surrounded him. And so this book is written uh, for us as he dialogues with God, as he laments to God, in fact, as he complains, and as he wrestles in his heart and mind with the whys and the how longs of the situation around him. What's interesting is that more than 2,600 years ago, Habakkuk asked some of the same questions that people all over the world are still asking today. Some of the questions that perhaps we're asking today. Questions like the state of our world, the brokenness that we see in our world. Dare I say questions surrounding this pandemic. Perhaps we're asking questions today about the fragmented state of some of the areas of our own lives, our families. Um, perhaps we're asking questions about the plans that we had for our life that may have been derailed by an illness or a trauma. But this morning, my prayer is that together, along with Habakkuk, we might discover more deeply, deeply the sovereignty of our Creator. And his sovereignty, his control over all circumstances, both historically in Habakkuk's day and in the present for us. I happen to believe from an experiential standpoint when it relates to my own journey and my own wrestling that the sovereignty of God is probably one of the most challenging truths of the Christian faith, but also one of the most beautiful beautiful truths of our faith. And so even though it may take some wrestling today 
and in our lives as we think about this or some lamenting or dare I say some ugly crying to fully wrap our heads around this truth and understand it the sovereignty of God, his ultimate control over all things. My prayer this morning is that we might gain a deeper understanding. And as a result, we might find some hope in our dark. And that brings us to the first truth that I'd like for us to look at this morning. And that is that understanding and experiencing the sovereignty of God requires a level of acceptance. In his first complaint to God, Habakkuk pretty much lays it on the line with him. He lays it on the line with God about just how ugly and brutal the landscape was around him. What was going on? And I, ha I cannot help but think and wonder that as he looked at the futility of everything that was going on around him, the context of what was happening he would have had to come to terms with his own inability to control any of it or to change it. I mean, where would he even start? It was messy. And I believe that Habakkuk's crying out to God was a direct result of his own acceptance of the fact that there really was no human power that was going to make any level of difference in the situation. I think that Habakkuk got it right when he went to God first. That showed a level of acceptance. He couldn't make sense of it. He couldn't sort it all out. He in and of himself could not make any difference except to admit his deep need for something greater than himself in what he was dealing with. Acceptance. He accepted that things were the way they were. He had to let go and he had to reach out. He had to make that choice. And he did just that, he chose. We've all heard throughout our lifetimes, the old adage, let go and let God. And sometimes it seems a little bit trite. And I will admit from my own life that there have been times when well-meaning people have reached out to me when I was particularly face down in a messy swamp of life swirling around me. And they dared to say, let go and let God, Allison. And I'll admit that my internal response was anything but acceptance. I'm sure possibly you could relate. In fact, admittedly, there were times then when my response to such a statement, the concept of letting go and letting God, there were times in response to that where my mind spun to such thoughts as, you have no idea what I'm dealing with here. I mean, let go and let God, easier said than done. Let go and let God, <laughs> sometimes my internal posture was, yeah, whatever. But the truth of the matter is that this is exactly what Habakkuk demonstrates right at the opening of this book, he let go. And even though he was complaining to God, he was lamenting to him, he was ruminating on all of these things that were going on, he took it to God. He was letting go of his control, his need to try and change the situation, and he reached out to the one who just might be able to make a difference. Habakkuk accepted the fact that things were messed up, and then he honestly and authentically came before his creator, pouring out his heart to him. He readily admitted his desperation and even the fact that he was really wrestling with it. He told God the truth. He had some serious questions. In Habakkuk 1 verse 2, he says these words that shows this desperation, that shows this questioning. He says, how long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere, but you do not come to save. Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Why must I watch all of this misery? I see destruction and violence, and I'm surrounded by people who choose to argue and fight. They love to argue and fight, he says. There's no justice, God. This doesn't make sense. 
There's more wickedness than anything good. And what did God do? What did God do? He welcomed it. He welcomed the lament. He welcomed the complaint for the simple fact that Habakkuk was choosing to reach out to his creator, just as he welcomes us to do the same, to pour it out, to lay it on, to don't hold back, to not hold back. And just like Habakkuk, when we pour out our discouragement and our disillusionment and our questions about everything that might be going on around us, we in turn cannot help but realize and hopefully admit and accept our deep need for a savior, our need, our deep, deep human need for God. But the story doesn't end. God took it from Habakkuk. He listened and he was attentive. He allowed Habakkuk to get it all out of his system, to tell him the truth, get it all off his chest. And then God responded when Habakkuk was quiet. And I like to think God probably said something like, I hear you. I hear you, Habakkuk. I see it everywhere as well. It's messy and it's ugly. It doesn't feel good and it's unfair. I like to think that God said, I know and I hear, but trust me. And that's what God said to Habakkuk in these scriptures. He said, but trust me. And that brings me to the second truth surrounding the sovereignty of God, his ultimate control and care. And that is that understanding the sovereignty of God in our lives means to trust and to trust even where we cannot see. Habakkuk had no idea what God was going to do. He really couldn't foresee the future any more than we can. And God simply said, wait, Habakkuk, wait, trust me, because I'm gonna do something incredible. Just wait, stand still. What Habakkuk could see all around him in the natural context of what was going on where he was living was not what was occurring in the supernatural where God was behind the scenes of the present landscape and terrain. Remember, it looked pretty grim to Habakkuk, but he waited and he trusted what God was doing. He believed that God was somewhere doing his God thing behind the scenes. And he believed that God would come through. God knew what he was doing in the context of Habakkuk's story, just like he knows what he's doing in the context of our story. Habakkuk just couldn't quite see it yet. And he had to wait and he had to trust. So he stood still. And he listened and he waited in complete acceptance of what was happening. And when he did this, God spoke a promise. Habakkuk 1 and 5 says, Look around and be amazed, for I am doing something in your day, something you wouldn't even believe if someone told you about it. So stand still and watch and be amazed. We don't know exactly how long It took how long Habakkuk had to stay in this state of waiting to see that evidence that God was working in this situation. It could have been months. It could have been years. We don't know. To Habakkuk, it may have seemed like an eternity, just like our waiting seems like an eternity. But still he waited and he trusted. And sometimes the season of waiting can be long and it can be arduous for us as well. It can be a painful mess of storms that broadside us, that leave our spirits crushed or our souls just chilled. Where are you, God? We might lament. Where are you? How long will this last? We might complain. Isn't it enough already, God? Haven't I suffered enough? I read a powerful story recently of a young woman You might be familiar with it, a singer, 
who was featured on a recent America's Got Talent season, who had endured a long battle with cancer, three different types of cancer, and multiple other life blows that rendered her completely broken and hopeless at one point in her life. And she literally found herself, she recounts, lying on the bathroom floor, incapacitated by her illness, weeping and sobbing between being sick to her stomach for hours and hours on end, and sometimes days and days on end. She talks of staring at the tile on her bathroom wall from the floor. In fact, her story is called God is on the bathroom floor. And she explains in her story how she had a choice in her situation to wait and trust, even though in the messiness of her situation, it was difficult. But she had a choice, trusting and really getting to know God by leaning into him or to become bitter and angry that her life was just not different. She certainly could not see from the bathroom floor, staring at the tiles, that God was anywhere present in her circumstance, in the natural context of what she was experiencing. But she chose instead to lean in instead of anger and bitterness. And this is what she says in her words. And I believe it's a powerful illustration of what God longs for from us. She says this in her story. This is who she is to God. I am God's downstairs neighbor, she says, banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with a song, sometimes with curses, sometimes with apologies and gifts, sometimes questions and demands. Sometimes I use my key under the mat and let myself in. Other times I sulk outside the door until he opens it up to me himself. She says, I've called God a cheat and a liar, and I've meant it. I've told him that I want to die, and I've meant it. Tears have become the only prayer that I know. And these tears, these prayers, roll over my nostrils and drip down my fore forearms, and they fall to the ground as I reach for him from the bathroom floor. These are the prayers I repeat night and day, sunrise to sunset. She waited. And even though it didn't feel nice, she reached. Quite literally, she reached from her bathroom floor in tears. And she leaned, pressing into the only one who could truly make a difference the sovereignty of God, the only one who could truly act. There was no human power to change her circumstances. She leaned into him to experience his comfort as she lay helpless, overcome by the sickness that was ravaging her body. And throughout her experience, she speaks of the story of the Israelites, which I'm reminded of as well today, wandering in the wilderness. And she came to realize from her experience that she was praying to that very same God, lamenting to him, complaining to him, crying in that same God's arms, that same sovereign God she trusted just as Habakkuk trusted as well. And in complete, in that complete reliance on God, they both began to find some hope in the dark. And that brings us to the third truth about the sovereignty of God. And that is that as we lean into God, trusting in his sovereignty, his ability to act at just the right time, we receive comfort even while we wait, when we lean in, when we trust, when we admit that there's no human power, we receive comfort, some level of peace, even in the midst of our darkness. Yes, even when we wait. And even when we're waiting in what seems to be a wilderness. As we accept our deep need for God, 
And as we trust and lean into him, we receive some hope in the dark, just as Habakkuk did in our text. Chapter three is a beautiful prayer that Habakkuk authors up to God as he found comfort in knowing that God was in ultimate control and that he was in fact working, even if he couldn't see it, even if Habakkuk couldn't see it at the time. And there was a surety and a confidence that came as Habakkuk's internal posture shifted from being hopeless and helpless and feeling futile in the face of what was going on. As he cried out to the Lord, his internal posture shifted towards hope. And even though he was still not necessarily understanding the reasons behind why things were happening as they were, he still trusted. And in that trust, he received comfort and strength. Habakkuk 3 verse 1 says, I've heard all about you, Lord. This is his prayer. I am filled with awe by your amazing works. He moves from his lament to uh, a posture of praise. He goes on to say, in this our deep time of need, help us again as we know you have in years gone by. A little further down in his prayer, he says these beautiful words of praise to the Lord. He says, even though the fig trees have no blossoms, and even though there are no grapes on the vines, even though the olive crop fails and the fields lie empty and barren, even though the flocks die in the fields and the cattle barns are empty, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God of my salvation because the sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes me as sure-footed as the deer, able to tread upon the heights. As his posture inside changed, he was able to find hope in the dark. Despite his lack of understanding, regardless of his perhaps wishing that things were different, regardless of his anger, and in spite of how broken and helpless and hopeless he might have felt. He found hope in the knowledge that he was not fighting this alone, that the sovereign God, his creator, ruler over all things was in control and he was able to sing. I'm reminded of the story of Horatio Spafford this morning as I conclude these thoughts on the sovereignty of God. And not, not unlike the testing that our friend Habakkuk experienced, Horatio Spafford, who penned the words of the age-old song, It Is Well With My Soul, experienced trouble. And it came in great measure for him prior to him penning those words. He had lost his four-year-old son. And only a year later after that, he had lost all of his investments, all of his monetary wealth in the Chicago fire where more than 300 people were killed and 10,000 people were left homeless. But despite his own loss in all of that, the Spaffords, he and his wife, continued to live out their Christian faith just like Habakkuk did, trusting in God's sovereignty, that somehow, somewhere there was a purpose. And they actually became known for assisting all of those in the Chicago fire that had become homeless. Two years after that Chicago fire, all of that devastation, Spafford decided that he should take his family on a holiday, a vacation to England. And so he did. And on November 22nd in 1873, while crossing the Atlantic, the steamship on which he had sent his wife and four daughters ahead of him was struck by an iron sailing ship. 226 people lost their lives on that ship that day, and it sunk with only in, with, within only 12 minutes. All four of Horatio Spafford's uh, daughters perished, but remarkably, his wife sur survived. And after being found unconscious and rescued, she was able to send word back to her husband. And her telegram read, saved alone. 
Receiving his wife's message, of course, he set off to go and meet her uh, across the Atlantic. And one particular day during that long voyage, the captain summoned Spafford to the bridge of the vessel, knowing what had transpired just days before. And pointing to his charts, the captain explained that they were just then passing over the very spot where the boat where his daughters had perished had sunk and where they had died and lost their lives. It is said that not long after that experience, standing on the hull of that boat, watching the waves, the sea billows, did Horatio return to his cabin and pen these words. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say it is well. It is well with my soul. And that second verse, though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded, the sovereign God has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. And there, in the cabin of that boat, as it passed that place where he had lost his daughters, Horatio Spafford found hope in the dark. And so today, as we've reflected on these three truths about the sovereignty of God, as we've reflected on our own need for acceptance of things being the way they are and our deep need for him, and as we've reflected on the fact that we really do need to trust even where we cannot see, And out of that trusting, we receive comfort and strength and hope in the dark. As we've reflected on this this morning, it could be that you have felt a need, your deep need, to find some hope in the uncertainty of your life. Or perhaps you are overwhelmed by the uncertainties that you are facing. And so what I would say to you this morning, in conclusion, that accepting and acknowledging your situation exactly as it is, like Habakkuk did, is the first step to finding that hope. And then I would say to you that confessing your deep need to God, your frustrations, your questions, your wrestling, and even your fears, that comes next. And finally, by making the decision to choose hope, trusting God to provide whatever is needed. That is the way forward. It's not necessarily the easiest way to move forward, but I believe as we have read the story of Habakkuk and how he wrestled with God, that that is the only way forward to find hope in the dark. Thank you, Allison, for that message. Such an important reminder that all that is around us is not all the reality that there is. We also have a spiritual and eternal reality. And Jesus came and he illustrated for us the priority of those realities, willing to die on this earth to be able to be raised again and at the right hand of the Father. Well, we too have that eternal hope and we look forward to that. But in the meantime, we live this life fully for Christ. I pray that as you have sensed the Holy Spirit in your life today during Allison's message, I pray that you will be caused to respond and walk in obedience to what he is saying to you, to us as a body of Christ. Let me pray with you. Dear Heavenly Father, you are a wonderful, loving, kind, eternal God, and you invite us to take on your character and become like Jesus. So Lord, we wanna do that step-by-step growing in our likeness of you. In these days, as we prepare to open, I pray that indeed you would prepare our hearts 
I pray that you would uh, help to look forward with anticipation to being not only together, but in your house, focused on you. In these days, I pray also that you will help us to reach out to others in care and sensitivity and kindness. That together we might be a caring body, caring for each other, loving each other well, and as a testimony to the world of the transforming influence of Jesus in our lives. I pray that we would always be agents of comfort, agents of peace and harmony, but that we would be ambassadors for you, helping people to look to you. Thank you, Lord. Be with those that are that are hurting. Be with those that are struggling in these days whereby perhaps we are not where we would like to be. Guide our steps and be real to us each day. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Grand earth was quaked before. sound of his voice and sees that I shake
my eyes are on you And through it all, through it all it is well And through it all, through it all my eyes